Hi, so today's video is going to be about aplastic anemia. This is part two of the aplastic anemia series. And we're going to start with pure red cell aplasia. So what is pure red cell aplasia? It is a rare disorder where the red blood cells are being selectively destroyed in the bone marrow. It is characterized with severe, chronic, normocytic, sometimes macrocytic anemia and there is decreased or no reticulocytes present in the peripheral blood. This anemia presents with no hemolysis or hemorrhage. So bone marrow is normal with the lack of the RBC precursors. So what are the causes of pure red cell aplasia? So it can be classified as congenital again or acquired. Acquired pure red cell aplasia can be acute or chronic. So viral illnesses can sometimes interfere with RBC production and the disappearance of erythroblasts in the bone marrow. One of these viral infections are caused by the parvovirus B19. Um, it infects RBC precursors. Another cause of acquired pure red cell aplasia is exposure to drugs. Similar drugs that are implicated in causing aplastic anemia is also a frequent suspect in causing pure red cell aplasia. These drugs are isoniazid and azathioprine. Azathioprine. I'll flash the word right here. Azathioprine. <laughs> These words, man. Okay, so now let's move on to congenital pure red cell aplasia, which is also known as diamond black fan anemia. Remember this because these words are thrown around during exams and you just want to be familiar with these words, especially pure red cell aplasia, diamond black fan anemia. For some reason, when I was a student, this never sticks in my head. Like, what kind of anemia is diamond black fan anemia? But it's actually a type of aplastic anemia. It is a congenital form of pure red cell aplasia, which is the destruction of your RBCs in the marrow. Um, that's that. So diamond black fan anemia presents as a chronic, moderate to severe anemia shows early in infancy and has normal WBC and platelet counts. It is a macrocytic anemia and occasionally is a normocytic anemia. So patients with diamond black fan anemia may present minor abnormalities on the head and the upper limb, such as in Fanconi's anemia. So it is unclear on what the mode of inheritance is or the mechanism of pathogenicity for diamond black fan anemia. However, what studies have shown is that there is a molecular defect on the responsiveness of RBC progenitors in the bone marrow to erythropoietin. So they're pretty much unresponsive to erythropoietin and that's why they are not you know, reproducing RBCs. And that's how you get pure red cell aplasia. There's also a group of anemias called congenital dyserythropoietic anemias. These are a little bit insignificant, in my opinion. I've never came across them during exams, but I'll cover them nonetheless because they are part of aplastic anemias. So it is a familial disorder with um, ineffective erythropoiesis that result in bizarre binuclear and multinuclear RBCs. So this is interesting. So you have the NRBCs, but they have like multiple nucleus in them. Anyway, so type 1 CDA is mild to moderate macrocytic anemia with prominent anisocytosis and poikilocytosis. A small number of 1-3% binucleated erythroblasts are in the marrow. Type 2 CDA will have 10 to 50% of binucleated or multinucleated erythroblasts. These RBCs will lyse in acidified serum, also known as the HAMS test. And I will talk more about the HAMS test later, but this is also why 
Type 2 CDA is also known as HEMPAS, which is the hereditary erythroblast multinuclearity with a positive acid serum test. Wow, that's a long name, but the abbreviated term is HEMPAS. So that's another word for type 2 CDA. Since it is positive lysis on the HAMS test, PNH can also be a possibility when diagnosing the disease. However, the difference in the cells of CDA type 2, type 2 is that they do not lyse in sugar water test. And sugar water test is one of the diagnostic tests that you do for people that are suspected to have PNH. PNH is paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, which I will cover in a little bit. Nor does it have characteristic flow cytometric finding of decreased CD55 and CD59. So another thing about the CDA type 2 RBCs is that they all express the I antigen on their surface. So what's the I antigen? If you are familiar with blood bank, then you probably know this already. But if not, then I antigen is just one of the many antigens that can possibly be present on your blood. Okay, because not everybody has that on their RBCs. But with the hemp pass, this person carries the I antigen all across their RBCs. Therefore, if the anti-I, which is the antibody for the I antigen, is mixed with this blood, it will cause agglutination. And that's another difference from the PNH patients because they don't have this strong agglutination uh, reaction to anti-I. Okay, so now let's move on to paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. So what is it? It is a rare acquired stem cell disorder that results in abnormalities of the red cell membrane. So now we're talking about the surface of the RBCs. Since it affects the stem cells, that means it affects not just the RBCs, but it affects everybody, the WBCs and the platelets. It is characterized by recurrent episodic intravascular hemolysis hemoglobinuria, and venous thrombosis. Nocturnal because it may be worse at night due to the decreased plasma pH, which triggers the hemolysis at night. Um, it is also strongly associated with aplastic anemia, so they go hand in hand. It is caused by a mutation that results in defects on the cell surface. The proteins that um, get affected are called the glycophosphatidylinositol or GPI anchor proteins. Let's say it one more time. <laughs> glycophosphatidylinositol anchor proteins. Whew! I'm just gonna flash this word here. Glycophosphatidylinositol anchor proteins. Wow, that's a mouthful. The mutated gene that causes this defect on the surface proteins is called the pig A for short. This is short for another nosebleed worthy word, which is phosphatidylinositol glycan. Okay, that one's a little, a little bit faster. Phosphatidylinositol glycan or pig A. This mutation affects at least 17 cell surface proteins, including proteins that affect complement fixation. Let me repeat that because that is important. It affects complement fixation. If you don't know what complement is, please check out my video. I did talk about complement on one of my videos and how to memorize it easier. Complement is an immune response that causes lysis on the cells. Okay, so this affects the cell surface proteins that regulate complement fixation. And since the defect causes a decrease or an absence of these regulatory proteins, it's not able to stop complement from happening on these cells. That means complement is able to, to like attach to the RBCs, WBCs, platelets, and cause lysis on these cells. 
So this explains why there is an increase in intravascular hemolysis. It's because complement is doing its thing on your RBCs, WBCs, and platelets. Most patients are anemic and mostly with severe anemia. Hemolysis occurs in an irregular fashion. So there is a chronic urinary iron loss which may lead to an iron deficiency. Abnormal platelet function in patients with PNH is frequently associated with venous thrombosis. It is a common cause of death in these patients. So they form clots in their veins. Um, lastly, it is important to remember that aplastic anemia can coexist or proceed with PNH. So they can go hand in hand. So lab evaluation of PNH. Of course, you have anemia, leukopenia, and thrombocytopenia. The anemia may be mild to severe depending on the subtype of PNH. So there are subtypes to PNH, type 1, 2, and 3, depending on sensitivity to complement lysis. So type 1 is near to normal lysis. Type 2 is increased lysis, about 10 to 15 times more sensitive to complement. And 3 is highly sensitive, which is 25 times more sensitive to lysis. Um, WBCs and platelets have the same membrane defects as the RBCs, making them sensitive to complement as well. As I've said earlier, this is going to affect all of your cell lines. Um, diagnostic testing for PNH includes hemosiderin in urine by staining with Prussian blue. So they're trying to detect you know, intravascular hemolysis. Um, sugar water test, which I mentioned earlier. Um, the sucrose solution will enhance complement action in the RBCs. So if you have this mutation and you're not able to regulate complement fixation, it will cause hemolysis in the test tube during the sugar water test and it will turn red or pink showing hemolysis and lysis of the cells so a positive sugar water test has to be confirmed by a positive hams test um, the hams test uses an acidified serum to lyse the cells so the acidified serum um, activates complement and it will increase the binding of complement into the RBCs with a PNH mutation and so it will lyse again and yeah so that's that and because they lack the anchor proteins uh, they are going to lyse and turn red on the test tube on the hams test as well so another very specific way of diagnosing PNH is just by using flow cytometry. Patients with PNH lack or have a decreased amount of CD55 and CD59, which are the GPI anchor proteins that are responsible for regula regulating complement fixation on these cells. So if they have absence or decreased amount of CD55 and CD59, flow cytometry will be able to pick that up and will specifically be able to say that this patient has PNH due to the lack or decreased amount of CD55 and CD59 on their RBCs. So treatment, let's go. <laughs> We're almost done. So treatment, treatment for PNH is usually supportive, but development of specific inhibitors of complement may aid in management of these patients. So another way would also be gene therapy. Also, patients with PNH um, consider this as a chronic disease. Um, thromboembolism is the primary suspect in causing the death of these patients who have PNH. And wah, we finish it. <laughs> We're done with aplastic anemia. Um, so happy. <laughs> That's that. So thank you for watching today. The next video will be the cramming session for aplastic anemia. But um, in between that, I might also uh, post other things that are more related to my profession 
as well. So thank you for watching today and my shirt is from my Teespring store. <laughs> Whoever is interested in hematology, please look up Clinical Lab Science. Um, you know, it could be a good prospect for you if you like science and stuff. So that's that. Thank you for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed this and it helps you on your learning. Until the next one, bye.